my name is Alf Hurst. I'm the Communications Director of the British National Union. I'd like to welcome you to this, our audience with the President. It's been a few months since we had our last session, so it's very exciting to see you all again and to get going with these really interesting sessions that we have. So for the next hour, I'm going to hand over to our president himself, Minister David Bruton, and he will introduce you to our guests. David. So good evening, ladies and gentlemen. It's so great to be back. Uh, as it seems an awful lot has happened since we last met in this format back in June. Uh, we obviously had the end of lockdown and in the early July, some of our churches were able to move forward and open uh, for public physical worship again, which was brilliant for many of us. Uh, we've also held our annual general meeting, which was delayed from the normal July date until um, October, when we held the meeting in a virtual format, which was very different for us all, but I have to say a very successful format indeed. We felt that with the advent of the second lockdown, uh, we would like to take the opportunity and actually respond to quite a few comments that we've been receiving uh, to bring back the audience with the president. And uh, I can promise you that over the next few weeks, we've got uh, quite an interesting selection of guests who will be taking part in the discussions that we're going to have. And uh, I hope that you will enjoy and take a full part in the discussions also. The format we're going to use is very much tried and tested from our last run. Uh, I will introduce the panel, tell you a little bit about them and their background, and then start by asking some general questions about our subject this week. And then we will open the floor up and it will give you the opportunity to ask any questions that you would want. Uh, this is very much a discussion forum. We felt that was important from the very start and it is your opportunity to ask any questions that you have. You may or may not be aware that yesterday saw the start of Interfaith Week. And I have to be honest with you, uh, last year, 2019, I thought, Finally, spiritualism and the SNU really <laughs> engage with Interfaith Week. We had quite a few events organised in various churches around the country, and uh, it really seemed to finally be moving forward, which was brilliant and a brilliant experience. Obviously, um, because of what's happened with COVID-19, Interfaith Week this year has become a virtual event. And this evening tonight is actually part of the SNU's contribution to Interfaith Week, uh, which, as I've said, started yesterday with the service in London where uh, we had the service, the National Service of Remembrance, which is also now involved in the Interfaith Week. So welcome to everybody. Uh, our numbers are building. It's nice to see both people that were with us last time and also one or two new faces. You are very, very welcome to join us. So this, the subject we have tonight is Interfaith Week. And I hope you feel that we've put together a suitable panel uh, to be able to really discuss and share some information about this important part of what we do within the union. Uh, my first guest on the panel to introduce to you is a gentleman, Ashley Beck. He is the Interfaith Development Officer with the Interfaith Network for the UK. Ashley was born and raised in Stevenage. As a teenager, he helped found and eventually chaired the local youth council and also sat on the local strategic partnership and deanery synod. He read theology at King's College London, followed by an MA in systematic theology. I hope he's going to explain the difference between that, that later. Um, throughout his studies, he became interested in interfaith dialogue, uh, beginning with learning about Judaism and to taking part in scriptural reasoning workshops. He was hired uh, by the Interfaith Network for the UK uh, to work on the second Interfaith Week and 2020 will be his 11th year. He told us before we actually came on that uh, he was initially um, 
contracted for a six month period. And I think the contract's just continually being expanded or whether they just haven't noticed yet and uh, you know that he's on board. But I can certainly speak for having worked with Ashley through IFN, he plays a tremendous part. Uh, as I've said, he's currently the Interfaith Development Officer and his work includes Interfaith Week, supporting IFN's governance and its membership subcommittee, IT systems, which is also very useful to have on board, engagement uh, with other equalities organisations and the IFN's youth focused work. In his spare time, not sure he gets much, but in his spare time, he enjoys riding his bike, long walks with other people's dogs. I like the sound of that, Ashley, I really do. And cooking, another one of my personal favourite subjects. So, ladies and gentlemen, can we welcome Ashley Beck? Thank you, Ashley, for joining us. Thank you. So, moving on to the second uh, member of our panel um, this evening. Uh, a gentleman that I'm sure some of you will know, um, and more will become evident as I introduce him. Uh, I'd like to welcome Father Leonard Young. Leonard Young is a Church of England parish priest for two churches in the East Midlands. Having spent uh, four years studying for a Liverpool degree, he achieved his honours uh, bachelor's degree in theology, uh, which was followed by study of at the Theological College for two years, and he acquired a pastoral and theological master's degree. Previously, of course, many of you will remember Leonard, who was the vice president of the Spiritualist National Union back in 96-97, a minister of the SNU, and he spent nearly 20 years as a lecturer and course organizer at the Arthur Finlay College. So Leonard is perhaps one of the few uh, members of the Church of England who certainly has a great insight into spiritualism and the SNU. And welcome Leonard, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me. Pleasure. So now we move forward to our final guest who has been uh, on the panel before for the uh, president's, the audience with the president. Uh, he describes himself as a lifelong spiritualist uh, from a spiritualist family. He is second generation minister. He's been a minister for 27 years, served on the Lyceum Central Committee for 11 years with three years as vice president, three years as president and now honorary vice president. He served on the SNU National Council and the National Executive Committee over several periods, including four years as chair of the Education and Exponents Committee. Served on numerous other committees at various times over the past 50 years. He's the former president of the South Western District Council for two extended periods, and he's currently their honorary vice president. Uh, David was closely involved with the Arthur Finlay College from its earliest, day, earliest days um, and was involved in many courses as the college was being established. He served on the committee of the International Spiritualist Federation for many years. He's also the co-author of two books for the SNU, The Philosophy of Spiritualism and The Religion of Spiritualism, the former of which is now a standard textbook in all SNU courses and issued to all of our new members. He also holds the SNU Long Service, Gold Service and Diamond Service Awards. And he's currently the Interfaith Ambassador um, and has been involved with IFN since we became uh, an associate member. And he has also spent three years sitting on the board of the IFN, uh, the trustees board of the IFN. David also um, is uh, a, a great writer. He writes regularly for Psychic News and I'm sure many of you will have read his pieces in PN. Um, he's also done a lot of media work for the SNU um, and always, always presents very, very well when he's speaking about one of his favourite subjects, which is spiritualism. So, David, without further ado, welcome and thank you very much for joining us. from yes, Sunday thank, you. thank you for the introduction, David. Thank you. So let's uh, start and uh, get things rolling. Um, and I'd like to invite Ashley 
first to tell us a little bit about the history and the development of Interfaith Week. Okay, thank you, David. Um, so Interfaith Week uh, was first established in 2009 in England, Northern Ireland and Wales. Um, and the idea for it came from Scottish Interfaith Week, which had been um, running successfully since 2004. Um, so uh, we had a number of trustees from uh, on our board at that time who were um, involved with Interfaith Scotland, had seen how successful the week had been there um, and suggested it to our board. Um, our board then suggested it to government uh, in, as part of its response to um, a public consultation document called Face to Face and Side by Side. Um, and for the first year, uh, it was agreed that the week would be run in partnership. So it was run between IFN and what was then called the Department for Communities and Local Government. Um, it then uh, it, it, it went better than expected. There were hundreds of activities, uh, a huge national launch event in the Queen Elizabeth Conference Centre. Um, and the, the board decided to take it forward from there. Um, and it's been running ever since. Um, as, as David said in my intro, um, I was hired to start working on Interfaith Week for the second year. So I wasn't there at the very beginning. I've been there since uh, Interfaith Week 2010. Um, and really the week has, has grown in quite interesting ways since then. So it's continued to have the same aims, uh, which are um, uh, increasing uh, interfaith understanding between uh, people of different faiths, also increasing understanding between people of religious and non-religious beliefs, and highlighting the important contribution that faith communities make to society. Um, and I think one of the really interesting things about Interfaith Week has been uh, the way that it has evolved in ways that, that perhaps we wouldn't have expected uh, when it was first set up. It's always been um, something which has enabled people to be very creative, uh, to, to come up with new ways of doing interfaith. Um, and it, it, it also has included um, a, a very broad range of constituencies, much broader than the membership of the interfaith network, because it also involves schools, universities, um, you know, government departments, police services, businesses, um, sports organisations, etc. So it, it's been a very interesting week uh, that continues to evolve. And of course, this year, uh, it evolves again, because it's nearly all online. Thank you, Ashley. That's, that's brilliant. You've, you, it's obviously been your baby now for 11 years. Um, can you just recall one moment where you thought, this is this is really helping to develop that dialogue between faiths or people generally, perhaps. Mm. In some ways, um, I think it's some of the smaller events that I've I've attended over the years that have really shown me that. I mean, there there are lots of good examples of, of kind of big national events with, with many faiths present, but actually, it's things like. Um, the, uh, the Batley Poets, for example, in, in West Yorkshire, uh, hold uh, a meeting each year during Interfaith Week. Their membership is mainly Christian, Muslim and non-religious. Um, and they're um, a community group uh, in Batley who meet not that often, a few times a year, and they, they read their own poetry to each other. Um, and I think that that event, um, in it, that, well, their, their uh, programme year round, has helped build connections between people of different backgrounds in a very organic way over a shared love of poetry. Um, and they really latched on to Interfaith Week about five, six years ago. They thought it really helped to um, amplify what they were doing um, and encourage um, the, the interfaith encounter that was happening there to start to be formalized and intentional. Um, so I think, yeah, some of those smaller activities like that um, really show for me the, the, the power of Interfaith Week. Brilliant, that's excellent. Thank you very much, Ashley. Can I come to Leonard and can, Leonard, um, how does Interfaith feature in your ministry? Uh, what's your experience? It varies from day to day, really, in some respects, because we encounter in the Church of England various faiths as you know, which is important. Um, 
I think what's also equally important is that we, you know, stretch the extra mile by working with other denominations within the parish that we have. And that works for us because we have joint services, usually one this week um, on Remembrance. Uh, we come together with the Methodists and the Roman Catholics, uh, Baptists and others that are around and that want to join us. So it's important that we do that because we can share not only our beliefs and faith, but we can also share community uh, events and other things which uh, are important to us uh, as a whole within any parish. I think that, you know, it, it builds um, and it has built here uh, since I came here uh, nearly, what, five years ago. Uh, and it's important that that should continue to build. Um, and and it's, it, it, it doesn't just happen this week. It continues throughout the year with various events on, you know, major feasts uh, that we have during the cycle of, um, you know, the Church of England's uh, um, uh, liturgy. Uh, Christmas and Advent, you know, Lent and Easter and Pentecost and all that, we come together and uh, we share what we can and we enjoy that. It's very important. Thank you, Leonard. Thank you very much. It's, it's good to, to get a, just a slightly different perspective there from the Church of England. Uh, I can certainly say uh, through working with Interfaith Week and um, last year IFN sent me out to Great Yarmouth um, and I, I actually attended an Interfaith service on behalf of IFN for the um, Interfaith Week and it was it was a brilliant experience. Um, there's some amazing people that you meet, uh, very committed, dedicated people and um, We've been certainly uh, welcomed very, very warmly um, by all many different religions. They don't all quite understand what as spiritualists we do, but mm. they are at least prepared to sit down and to talk. And it's it, I personally find it fascinating to get people talking about their own religion and their own experience of faith and religion and, and how it shaped their lives. And I think that's a, that's an amazing opportunity that Interfaith Week certainly provides us. David, can I come to you now? Um, you, I know, have been uh, one of our leading lights within the SNU and you've worked incredibly hard as our Interfaith Ambassador. And... Um, how what what's your experience of how things are going since we took that first tentative step uh, i think it must be five or six years ago now um to join the ifn uh, i think fortunately things have moved on quite a bit and we have uh, as an organization uh, as a faith uh we've made a mark within the IFN because as you rightly suggested just now, there are many people who are not quite sure what spiritualism is about and who these strange spiritualists are. Uh, we do uh, go into organizations like the IFN into places with a degree of baggage um, uh, people think that we do all sorts of strange things. Uh, well, we may do privately, but we don't do it uh, as a public face. Uh, but um, it, it's been good to tell people what spiritualism is about and to find that once we explain to them um, how we run our organization, how we run our services, and particularly about our seven principles, uh, I can remember you and I having a, a, a chat with a, a couple of ladies and we were talking about the seven principles and we went all the way through them, explaining how we viewed them. And at the end they said, well, we can't really disagree with anything there. And I think that's important to realize that 
the things that unite people of faith are far greater than those than those which divide them. We know there are terrible problems with those who are fanatical about their beliefs, but for those who are open-minded and who approach other faiths with understanding and respect and the realization that we are all seekers after truth, then we can come together and learn a great deal. And it's not just other faiths learning about us, it's us learning about other faiths. And though we may disagree on many issues, there are of far more issues that bring us together the belief in a divine being that has created us all and that we are all linked together all life forms humankind and animals we are linked together in a spirit of love and growth and progression and i think that for me has been one of the most important things that i've learnt over the past few years of our involvement. Thank you, Daidi. Uh, as I mentioned a little bit earlier, I, I was honoured yesterday to attend the National Service of Remembrance at the Cenotaph. Um, remembrance, I think it is true to say, has been very different this year, uh, and I'm sure many will have seen it reported that only 26 veterans were actually allowed to take part in the service because we were all desperately socially distancing uh, instead of the new, normally 10,000 that, that actually turn up for the London service. Um, Leonard, can I ask you, um, I'm sure Remembrance is a very important part of, um, uh, of uh, the Church of England and Christianity. Um, how did you approach this uh, for your congregation this year? How, 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 how are you able to do it? Uh, remembrance through lockdown? Well, the churches are open, you know, for private prayer, yeah. and that is important. And I think it's also important while people are there to spend time with them and to reflect, if we can, as clergy, uh, over the, you know, over both the COVID situation and more specifically what Remembrance is about. Um, and quietly we went about doing a very simple act of Remembrance uh, in both churches. It was not a service as such, but it was an act. So it doesn't stop people because you are, you know, technically in a lockdown situation in churches, as you know. But because we are open for private prayer, we can give them something to do so that they can remember. And we can prepare things in advance to help them uh, follow a very simple act of remembrance, which is what we did. And... Uh, members of the congregation were pleased with what we were able to do and I think they went away not disheartened as perhaps some people might have been but rather uh, lifted because we were able to think about those that had passed and those that had gone to war but also for those that are tackling this unseen war as it is, uh, this COVID-19. And it was an opportunity to not only pray for, uh, you know, veterans, et cetera, but it was also an opportunity to pray for the National Health Service. And I think that helped us a great deal uh, at this time. And it was just simple, uh, you know, by lighting a candle, uh, following a service themselves, we laid the poppy reef where we normally lay it in church um, and they followed the service, but quite silently as it were. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Ashley, um, 
for the union um, and for spiritualism in general, uh, the invitation three years ago to actually take part in the Cenotaph was an amazing thing for us all. And I know that it really lifted the movement as a whole. Um, do you see this um, opening up to a wider range of faiths? I know this is an, a subject that IFN have certainly grappled with in, the, in its history. Uh, and, um, you know, to make, to make it more inclusive, to, 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 to represent really a very diverse society that we have in the UK um, with many, many different religions. What, what, what's your thinking? Yeah, I think, um, I mean, certainly the question of, of remembrance is a, and, and multi-faith remembrance is a hugely important one. Um, and we, we sort of advised um, government on that, but we also worked, as you know, with the Royal British Legion um, and helped them um, to make contact with a, a wider range of faith traditions than they, they had previously done. So um, that, that was sort of through um, working with them on a round table, which they convened. Um, and I think, you know, part of it is the realisation and it, it was linked, um, the timing of it uh, was particularly linked to the centenary of World War One. That's why some of these questions started to be asked, I think. Um, and they were, they were asked because there's an almost scandalous history um, in this country of forgetting that huge numbers of people who fought and died in World War One were from what are now the Commonwealth countries. Um, um, and they, they came from, you know, Hindu and Muslim and Buddhist and Sikh um, uh, and Zoroastrian, etc. traditions, which is a sort of forgotten or was a forgotten bit of, of British history. And I think the, the centenary of World War I started to put the focus on that. Uh, and it, it, it meant that those questions started to be asked. And that's why um, then there was also a kind of re-examining of, well, it's not just the Commonwealth. There are, there are many other smaller traditions within the UK itself who would have served in World War I, um, whether militarily or, or in civilian service. Um, and so that, that, that started to, to open that question up. Um, in terms of um, our own organisational membership, um, I know uh, really, I think we had reached a point where um, that had become almost inevitable. Um, it, it, it's interesting looking back at the founding of the network. Um, as you know, we originally linked actually eight traditions and it became nine a year or two later. Um, in some ways, I think the, the question is possibly why it was nine rather than six to begin with, because there were kind of six world religions everybody had heard of. Um, and then uh, we, we also had um, Jainism, Zoroastrianism and the Baha'i faith from, from very early in the network's life. And I think at that point, it, it, rep it reflected um, where the state of interfaith dialogue was in the country. Um, interestingly, IFN was always a mixture of national faith bodies and grassroots interfaith bodies. Um, when we were founded, I think we had 60 founder members, about half of which were local interfaith groups. And it was really just saying, well, what are the traditions that are most involved at that point? Um, and that those, those were the ones that initially got invited. And I think over time, um, we became routinized, we became slightly stuck. Um, and it, it was very important that we actually readdressed some of those questions. So um, yeah, our policy changed well, six, six years ago now, I think. Um, and it's now open to any um, faith tradition as long as it you know, shares our values, which are about the importance of, of interfaith engagement. Um, and as long as it's, I think, it, you know, got a constitution and has existed for five years or so. Brilliant. Just very quick. I think it's probably worth mentioning, David, yes. that the SNU literally wrote about 20, 22 years ago, requesting to attend the right. Remembrance Service. Yes. I recall that very well indeed. Yes. 
Oh, absolutely. And it was, a, a from my memory, it was a regular subject at conference. Uh, why, can't, why can't spiritualists be there? Um, yeah, yes, absolutely. And, I, and they were, I, I remember one very well-known uh, medium in the Midlands. He was called Jack Corbett. Uh, some people may know him, but he, he's been passed away a long time ago. A marvellous man, uh, and I loved him to bits. He was really very good. Uh, but he used to say, you know, I served in the war, but I can't go. Uh, and, and, and it was that that was always a bit of a bugbear for him, right until he died. Yes, absolutely, absolutely. Yes, it was it really... Uh, oh, I'm glad it's moved on. Absolutely, yeah, tremendous. Ashley, can I just come very quickly back to you? And then I'm very conscious that time's ticking on and I want to bring our uh, audience in. Um, is the model that we're seeing in the UK with the development of IFN um, and interfaith dialogue, is that happening in other countries around the world, to your knowledge? Not, um, not in quite the same way, as far as I'm aware. Um, there are, um, firstly, I think we are unique in having a kind of linking structure um, at a national level um, in the UK. Not unique in the sense of each, each of the three devolved nations in the UK also has them. Uh, but outside of, of the British Isles, I'm not aware of something that's quite like IFN in that it brings together the national faith communities and the grassroots activities and, and some of the national interface structures. Um, there are uh, initiatives to try and build things that are, that are similar to IFN. There is one in, in Germany. Actually, I think there are now two in Germany. Um, and uh, we interestingly get visits occasionally at the network from um, sort of diplomatic delegations from other countries that want to learn a bit more about how um, how interfaith activity and multi-faith society um, are done in the UK. Um, so I think um, you know, there's potential for, for export really, um, but at the moment uh, I think we are fairly unique That's brilliant, yes. I know we, we certainly through the union and through our um, internet basis we have uh, people that follow us around the globe 34 35 countries uh, snui is involved with and uh, i'm sure uh, there'll be one or two people that will be interested to hear our experience in the uk and maybe in time try and replicate it in their own country because it has to be beneficial in my view anyway Okay, so Alv, I'm going to uh, open things up and uh, I'm sure that, uh, well, I hope that uh, the debate so far has uh, created a few questions. Uh, so uh, let's open up and see where we go. Absolutely, such a, a fascinating area and just so much to investigate for us all. I'm going to ask if anyone's got any questions or any comments or any experiences that they've had with interfaith activities over the years, perhaps at your church or as an individual. If you'd like to do that, do put up your hand or let me know in the chat box. Tim, I'm going to ask you to mute your microphone and to join us. Thank you. I, I thank David. He's been such a stalwart first to keep this alive so long. But I thought I was reading recently a Conan Doyle book and he has a chapter called The Religious Aspects of Spiritualism. And the first sentence, first chapter is this, and I thought it's so fitting. Spiritualism is a system of thought and knowledge which can be reconciled with any religion. The basic facts are the continuity of personality and the power of communication after oh. death. These two basic facts are as great as of great importance to a Brahmin, a Mahabharatan, Parsi as it are to a Christian. Therefore, spiritualism makes a, a universal appeal. And I thought that was written a um, hundred years ago. Isn't that interesting? Yeah. <laughs> That's all I want to add. It, it, it's amazing how we finally caught up. We, we're getting We're getting there. We are. Thank you, Tim. A great comment there and a great find in, in the literature there. Okay, I'm going to open it out to anyone else if anyone has any questions or any comments or any thoughts about anything that our panel have said so far. 
I have a question which I'd just like to ask uh, quickly to Ashley. We were talking a little bit about uh, earlier that uh, this year, being his 11th year in Interfaith Week, is very, very different and perhaps uh, standing quite uniquely compared to the others. Ashley, do you think that the years to come will have been changed by our experience of how we're uh, congregating online this year? Do you think it will have any uh, effect on future interfaith weeks? Absolutely, yeah, yeah. I think um, one of the really interesting things we've been learning this year, um, not just through interfaith week, but leading up to it, um, has been the great possibilities that, that um, things like Zoom uh, and webinar formats, et cetera, give to us. Um, it, you know, we, we, we always struggle, I think, and local interfaith groups often struggle with this, that there's never a perfect time to hold meetings. Because if you do them during the day, people, some people are at work. If you do them in the evening, some people have childcare. And whatever point on the weekend you hold it is someone's time of, of, of worship and celebration. So there's, there's never a really good time, but what, one of the benefits of Zoom meetings, of course, is you don't have to travel. Um, so if, if usually attending a meeting includes an hour, hour and a half of travel, you know, uh, round trip, uh, then you don't have to worry about that so much. And also, of course, you can be on Zoom while the kids are in the next room safely, whereas, you know, if you're coming to a meeting, you have to arrange childcare. So I think that, that has, has opened up really big possibilities. Um, the other aspect, of course, is that there's no geographical constraint um, with, with meeting online. So um, we've heard tales from local interfaith groups who've been able to get a guest speaker in from the other side of the country or even the other side of the world, which would have just been impossible before because they don't have the money to you know, pay people to travel. So, yeah, I think it's, it's really um, reshaping the way people think about the possibilities of interfaith. Thank you. Thank you, Ashley, for, for answering that question. Um, really interesting to see how things will unfold in future years. And let's hope things are very different, perhaps uh, for much better reasons in, in future years. Um, I'm going to invite Helena to switch on her microphone and to come into the room and to make your point or ask your question. Um, just a quick question to either or any of the panel is, uh, um, surely with um, the pandemic as has happened that you must have found that we've all got a kind of common cause that there has been a lot of losses that, you know, this could be a way forward to kind of unite all religions, as I say, as taking it forward that we're all sharing a common cause, not divided by war, but a common cause of loss of lives that you know you'd be able to reach out to everyone that, that's basically my comment thank you thanks Helena for that point uh thank you very much and I'm just going to uh pop over to the chat box now um and Alan has made a comment about how spiritualism has managed to be accepted at the Remembrance Sunday. Uh, and perhaps I might be able to answer this one as well. And he talks about the progress uh, that's been made in terms of thought for the day on Radio 4. Um, we have looked into this uh, in the past. And uh, as far as we understand it, that the thought for the day is outsourced to a different production company and they don't often uh, recruit new speakers, but it's something that we do monitor. It would be fantastic if we could do that. Um, and I think one of the things that we've learned uh, during this lockdown is that we can start to reach more people as well by sharing uh, information about spiritualism online through Zoom and these kinds of meetings. And I'm sure that's something uh, that other religions and faiths have, have discovered as well. I wondered as well if there was anyone out there in our audience who had any questions for our panel, if perhaps you are thinking about having any interfaith involvement in your church, or if you have done, 
Uh, if you've got any questions about that, if you want to ask our panel any questions about that. Uh, and while you're thinking about that, uh, Sophie, I just saw a hand go up there. I'm going to invite you to unmute your microphone and to come into the room. Hi, Sophie. Hi, good evening, everyone. Um, my um, question is with regards to um, my background back in the sort of 80s and 90s within um, our spiritualist churches, having hecklers present from Baptist church. Now, I've noticed that hasn't continued gratefully into recent years at all. Um, and I'm just wondering whether that started a long time ago, whether that was just a small couple of decades, still not nice, but um, does anybody know where that started? What is there something within Baptist um, beliefs that, I mean, I was aware of people feeling that they, they were expecting us to be sitting in the dark, worshiping the devil. That was all that we often would get um, in terms of a response. But I just wondered if there's anything more that anybody knows as to why our religion seemed to be a cause of such um, concern and, and upset and distress for people of a Baptist faith who felt the need to come and heckle. I just wonder if anybody's got anything that they can add to that. Can I, can I ask maybe either David or Leonard, they, they may have some input on that. Thoughts well, on David, that? I'll, I'll respond, but uh, David wants to respond, I'll follow him. Yeah, uh, you go ahead, Leonard, I'll come in after you as no. We won't fight though. I, 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 I think the first thing that you, we, we, we need to get away from is labeling it as the Baptists, because I think what you would have found as a whole, that those that, as you say, heckled or protested outside meetings and churches, etc., um, would have been from a wide range of uh, Christian belief. And it would have been anything from perhaps the Pentecostal to the Baptist to even maybe even very sort of evangelical Methodists or Church of England for that matter because it was within their sort of how can you say it but you know they felt it was in their ministry mm -hmm. to do that um, and I think part of the other argument there is that it spiritualism has not been seen for a long time as a religion by the majority and I think that's the problem and it's how you define religion um, and I think religion is a, a, a word I don't like to use very often I'll be honest with you because I think you know when we look at who we are whether we're spiritualist, Christian, uh, you know, it, it come from Buddhism or whatever else we come from, we are worshipping in some way a God. Uh, now, spiritualists believe that God is a sort of collective consciousness in that sense. Uh, the church itself, you know, the Anglican church particularly, and the Christian faith believe in God as Father and God as Son and God as Holy Spirit. It's how you define that and pull that apart to understand where you are as a Christian or in some way, perhaps even as a spiritualist. Because let's be very frank here, that no matter what a person may believe, they have a right, I believe, a fundamental right to accept God in or on their terms, not in their terms, on their terms. Yeah. And that's a difficult one because the church puts, you know, it in a bit of a contract. We call it a creed. You call it seven principles. <laughs> if we look at both of them, you'd find that both 
actually work very close together. There's just some pieces of those, you know, the creed or, or, or the seven principles that, you know, bifurcate at some point uh, there. Um, and I think that's important. We shouldn't label. I think it's, I think it's wrong to label. I think perhaps we need to learn more tolerance. And I've known spiritualists quite the, quite the opposite, you know, when it comes down to Christians, you know, they'd rather hang me sometimes, you know, um, because of certain things. And, and, and that's fine, but that's their view. They have a particular view of Christianity. And sometimes it's not a well-educated view. And that's a problem, I think, in, you know, with, with anything, that we need to have good education, both with our own theology and our own ism and philosophy. You know, it's, that's the important thing, to have education. And unfortunately, and I think, you know, I'm not criticising the SNU here, well, probably a bit, but uh, you know, over the years, it's developed that educational frontier. In my day, there was the education uh, there for so many people, but it's not as good as it is today. I mean, I do periodically have a look through what's going on because I'm nosy, but you know, that's important, and it's important that the SNU as does the Church of England and all of the religions, educate. And we're in the business of it. And if we don't do it well, then there's a problem. I hope that helps you understand. That's a, a point well made, made there, Leonard. David, uh, I'm sure you've got something to add to that debate. Yes, uh, I mean, I would agree with a great deal of, of what Leonard said. Uh, I think we... It, where our, our questioner uh, talked about 20 or 30 years, certainly through my own family history, I can go back a lot further than that when there was a great deal of antagonism towards spiritualism with uh, windows of meeting places being broken and all kinds of unpleasantness happening. Uh, but again, it was a lack of understanding and also the feeling that some within certain religions feel that they have a, a, a duty of seeking to convert others who have a different view. And one of the things about spiritualism, and again, this has already been mentioned, is that we're, a, <laughs> excuse the expression, a very broad church. We are an umbrella under which many aspects of many different faiths can come together uh, and we don't seek to convert what we do is that we offer the experience and the knowledge that we think we've gained in the hope that it might be of use to others and if they find something of value fine if they don't then we wish them well in their search but we are in the process of trying to gain respect for ourselves as a, 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 as a religion. And I uh, agree with Leonard that that word brings all sorts of connotations with it. But we're also in the business of sharing respect with others. And we must always remember that old idea that though I may not disagree uh, that though I may disagree with what you say, I will fight for your right to say it. And if we can establish that amongst those of faith and indeed of no faith uh, in this country and throughout the world, I think the, the world generally would be a much better, a much safer and a much happier place spiritualists have had their share of antagonism over the years that has changed there is still a lot of antipathy towards us and we just have to accept that um, but 
as long as we say to others, okay, you have the right to your views, but I also have the right to mine. Mm -hmm. Yeah, good point. Here are Sophie, that became a discussion in itself, didn't it? <laughs> well, thank you. <laughs> thank you, Sophie. Uh, and great to hear those responses. And I think very encouraging to just think about the progress that we've made and the, the connections that we've made and the, the friendships that we've made. I think it just makes the world a better place. So thank you for that. I'm going to invite Linda now to unmute her microphone and to come into the room and to make your point. Good evening. Good evening. Go ahead, Linda. There you are. Hello. <laughs> um, good evening, everyone. I'd like to just put a question to Father Leonard, if I may. Um, I was uh, interested to, to hear that he had, uh, for quite a number of years, um, a very active um, part within spiritualism. And now he's obviously got a very active part um, within um, Christianity and, and the Anglican Church. And I would just like to ask if, um, uh, um, uh, Leonard, if your experience within spiritualism, your, your knowledge and your understanding um, has brought something to your uh, now your practice of Christianity um, within the work that you do in the church and, and particularly with the um, interfaith network? Well, I, I, I think any experience in life, you know, uh, helps us to, to form new avenues of thought. And, you know, I, I, I remember when I was at the Arthur Finlay College for many years, I used to always quote Virginia Satir, who was a great therapist, but she was also quite a wise woman. And she wrote um, a wonderful verse, you know, uh, uh, and in it, it says, I give myself permission to discover me. And I think if we look at no matter who we are or what we do or where we go and how we develop, you know, we are giving ourselves permission to add to the experience of our life. Now, if you look at the seven principles, you know, it's personal responsibility. If you look at the Christian faith, personal responsibility is still there in the Christian faith. It doesn't have any, it, 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 it's not pushed away because you say, well, I'm a Christian, so it doesn't matter to me. It does. And our personal responsibilities to each other, but more specifically to ourselves and how we use the experience of the past to help us in every situation. I mean, there will be days when, you know, uh, uh, because I was a therapist and, you know, I, I worked in that particular way. I use that type of uh, skill um, when, you know, dealing with people. Um, and sometimes, you know, my experience of the past uh, in spiritualism also is an asset to be, to have. I don't see it as anything else. It's something that you add to. And so, you know, I, I, I'm afraid I'm not one of these um, Christians that's black and white. You know, I, I can't be doing with that. It just doesn't sit with me. I have a very open mind uh, about a lot of things. Uh, some of them I'm not really allowed to say, but you know, most of them I can get away with. And so, you know, it, 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 in that sense, I will use whatever skill I have if I am to be a pastor to, you know, the people that are uh, in my church. Because when a priest is licensed, they are given, you know, by the bishop, the cure of souls for that particular parish. And that's an important charge given to an individual person. And, you know, it's not one that is not shared because you share it with your colleagues or the other clergy. 
So I believe that, you know, if some of my experience of the past can help, then yes, it should. Uh, I'll give you one little thought here, uh, just, you know, uh, teasing perhaps when I was at Theological College, uh, I studied at uh, uh, um, a theological college in Yorkshire, um, in Murfield. And uh, there was a person came to give us um, a, a sort of lecture on what's called deliverance. And I thought, oh, this is right up my street, you know, because when I taught at the college, one of the um, weeks that our weekends that I used to do was hauntings and things like that. So I was really into this. This guy came and I, I, I'm not criticising him, but he had a very blinkered view of what, you know, uh, certain things like that were and how he dealt with them. And I was a bit taken aback and questioned him about it. And I said, well, what about the Enfield poltergeist? And, uh, you know, the situation that happened in Enfield in the, I think it was the 60s, because I used to work with Maurice Gross uh, at the college and Professor Archie Roy and, and those types of people. And he couldn't answer me because he didn't know the case, which I found rather, you know, uh, disturbing that somebody was lecturing at the college and hadn't got a clue about what had happened not so many years ago. Can you see what I'm saying? So it, I wasn't being critical of him. I was just thinking, well, you know, surely we should be able to share this information, um, you know, together and, you know, use it. And we did. And we had a very good conversation after that lecture. Uh, and I pointed him in the right direction of a very few good boot books to read to help him on his way <laughs> but uh, I think it was just one of those things that happened and that's the way it was but it was fun as well thank you, thank you very much I hope that helps you yes yeah, certainly yes thank you Linda for that question fantastic we are amazingly out of time the hour has just flown by so I'm going to hand back to uh, Minister David Bruton for the end of this hour. So ladies and gentlemen, I hope that you've all enjoyed our evening's discussion. Um, I would like to give my personal thanks on your behalf to our panel, uh, to Ashley Beck from IFN, uh, to Father Leonard Young uh, from the Church of England, uh, amongst other places, hey Leonard? And, uh, well indeed. <laughs> And also to uh, Minister David Hopkins, our, our interfaith ambassador. It, it's truly been an interesting evening and I hope that uh, if you were feeling, um, you know, you didn't understand I, uh, interfaith, uh, how it fitted in, that certainly we've given you uh, a few pointers to go and investigate things a little bit more. Uh, moving forward and looking to next week, we're back here at seven o'clock next Monday evening. Um, and my guest next week will be Karen Francis McCarthy. Um, Karen was a, a journalist. Um, she was based in New York and also she uh, served in quite a few war zones around the world. Um, she describes herself as a great skeptic until her fiance suddenly died without any warning. And she became uh, involved investigating spiritualism and has written a lovely little book, uh, Till Death Don't Us Part. Um, she is a member of the SNU and having read the book, she uh, certainly has a fascinating story and we'll be sharing her experiences and her understandings coming from uh, the world of journalism and seeing the transformation as she became a spiritualist and realizing the man that she loved and desperately missed was still very much part of her life's experience. So I'm really looking forward to welcoming Karen next week. I'd like to thank you all for joining us this evening. And uh, the, as Alva said, the evening is being recorded. Um, th that was something we certainly learned from the last run. 
because we have people uh, in Australia and other parts of the world who like to catch up, but unfortunately they're in bed at the moment. So uh, by recording and broadcasting later, it gives them the opportunity. And also you, uh, we put the uh, recordings out on the SNU YouTube channel so you can go back and uh, share what we've had tonight once again. So I'm going to now hand back to Alf. Thank you for joining us for the first audience with the president uh, in this latest lockdown and look forward to you joining us next week. Thank you, Alf. Thank you, David. Thank you for being our host this evening and uh, my gratitude to our guests as well for just a fantastic hour together. Before you go, just a little bit of information to catch up with uh, what's happening in Interfaith Week, you need to visit the website, which is interfaithweek.org. And of course, Interfaith Week is enabled by the Interfaith Network, of which uh, the British National Union is part of. So please visit interfaith.org.uk to find out more about their work too. And you also find uh, information about their social media channels as well. So I suggest that you follow them so that you can keep properly up to date with what's happening, not just in Interfaith Week, but throughout the year as well. For the British National Union, please visit snu.org.uk. And to find out what's happening online, do visit our website for SNUI, which is our internet branch, which is snui.org. And if you go to the tuitions program page, you'll find out the other things that are happening. On Friday at 6.30, we have our weekly healing service, and that's an opportunity for us to consciously spend time together in the presence of God and God's healing presence. And it's a wonderful time of community that we share together. And then every Sunday as well at 6.30, although our, our, our churches are closed at the moment, we are still operating our divine services every Sunday at 6.30. So you'll find the links to that on snui.org. And if you'd like to follow our social media channels, the Spiritualist National Union on Facebook and at Spiritualist SNU on Twitter, and Instagram, you'll be able to keep up to date with what's happening. I think one of the most amazing things that we've been reminded of this hour is that there is so much more that connects us than divides us. And I think that's something that's not just about interfaith, that's just about society. So let's leave on that thought and let's all stay connected, not just in interfaith week, but throughout the year. And if we keep on building those bridges and we keep on making those connections together, we are making a stronger world that we all need, particularly at this moment. Thank you so much for joining us. Look out on our uh, social media channels and our SNU film YouTube channel, and you'll be able to watch this program again. If you're going to be sharing any posts about Interfaith Week, use the hashtag Hashtag Interfake Week. Spread the word. Let people know about it. Thanks for joining us. We'll look forward to seeing you soon. Take care and God bless everyone. Bye-bye.